Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks very much for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Jake. I'm the curator of Defrag here at the studios. Um, so these events kind of explore how um, human behavior is changing as a result of the exponential technological acceleration that we're seeing. And beyond this, the series is kind of investigating how uh, technology is changing the, both the production and the consumption of art and culture. So for this evening's event, I'm really pleased to welcome members of the Feminist Internet Collective uh, and their chief leopard, Dr. Charlotte Webb, um, as well as an awesome lineup of speakers. So without further ado, the Feminist Internet. Well, welcome everybody to the Feminist Internet Digital Clinic. To give you an introduction to what the Feminist Internet actually is, we've created a short video and we will be premiering that video with you this evening. So I'm gonna go right ahead and show you what we're all about. The internet is a sprawling force that holds the potential for liberation, creativity and political transformation. However, many of society's inequalities are encoded in its structures, processes and communities. Whether it's the predominance of women suffering from online trolling. And no one was the target of that more than Diane Abbott. The relentless commodification of people's bodies. So everything I did was for views, for likes, for followers. The dominance of males in the tech sector, unequal pay, the marginalisation of women from black and ethnic minorities. I put on the TV and only saw pale skin. All prejudices against members of LGBTQ plus communities, there are still many problems to respond to. And if you're thinking, well, come on, that doesn't seem like that big a problem, well, congratulations on your white penis. We are artists and designers who believe in the power of creativity and criticality to transform how the world unfolds and how it is understood. We believe there is a need to go beyond current definitions and images of gender, race and class. We are using our imaginations and our collective solidarity to intervene in the development of the web to ensure it promotes gender equality, equal rights and justice for all. Feminist Internet is a UAL project supported by careers and employability. The teaching and learning exchange and UAL Futures, bringing UAL students, staff and industry together across disciplines to invent better futures. It started as a seminar series and a UAL Futures studio where we prototyped creative responses to issues of gender equality and technology. Our feminist internet seminars tackle the social and political issues at stake. Feminisms and the future of work. How are women going to feature as the world of work is radically transformed by automation and disruptions to existing business models? Visibility and representation. Why does the media still present a palatable, white, hyper-capitalist version of feminism? Biocapital feminisms and the female body. How are bodies, sexuality and experiences commercialised and how can we resist online sexism? Technological feminisms. What is a feminist technology? What does it look like and how is it made? How can we ensure that technologies produce feminist ideologies? The Feminist Internet Studio was made up of 16 strangers with two common passions, feminism and the internet. We were students and alumni from a range of backgrounds and disciplines. We had one mission, to create a feminist internet manifesto and develop creative responses that embodied our manifesto. Our philosophy. We had one core philosophy. We operate as one studio. We believe collaboration and cooperation, not competition, should underpin cultural production. Everyone was responsible for everything. We evolved our manifesto as a collective through consensus. Learning partners joined us along the way to give us the ideologies, tools and strategies we needed to make our ideas a reality. We looked at four areas where we thought we could make a difference. Education, domestic spaces, companies and the streets. So, with 16 strangers, a passion, a mission, a philosophy and a family of learning partners, we created the Feminist Internet Manifesto. The Feminist Internet Manifesto. The Feminist Internet erases feminism. The Feminist Internet integrates the physical and digital. The Feminist Internet is about cooperation, not competition. The Feminist Internet eradicates violence. The Feminist Internet redefines value. The Feminist Internet confronts uncomfortable truths. The Feminist Internet recodes gender. The Feminist Internet educates. There is no feminism. Only possible feminisms. There is no internet. Only possible internet. Yeah, sounds great.
Okay, so that was an introduction to the feminist internet, and I hope you will all follow us and uh, join in with what we're doing. We're here this evening because um, online abuse and harassment is a virus which is infecting the internet, and we want to collectively produce antibodies that are going to build some immunity and fight this infection. And we felt like the figure of the virus was fruitful because it implies many multiple meanings and it presses on both biological and computational processes uh, as well as the notion of viral media reproduction. So in a general sense a virus refers to a harmful or corrupting force um, which I think describes harassment very well because this is a social phenomenon that, that corrupts the potential for the internet to be um, a space of emancipation, of freedom and of relative safety. So, from a biological point of view, um, a virus is an infective agent, and it has the ability to permeate and disturb cellular boundaries. And that's very, it's very useful for us because a lot of what we do hinges on trying to collapse binary thinking, dichotomous thinking, and we want to really be able to disturb boundaries between categories like male and female, bodies, technologies, um, material, digital. So this is also prescient in the context of online abuse because a simplistic distinction between the online and the offline is sometimes used to kind of rationalize this type of behavior. So you may hear an argument about, well, it doesn't really matter because it's just happening on the internet. I've even heard victims of harassment speaking about it in that way. Um, but that argument very quickly collapses when we sort of acknowledge that our online experiences are just as real as our offline experiences. Some people would say they're more real. Um, and, and when we also acknowledge that the consequences of online abuse are felt in the real world very concretely. So take an example of online harassment, which refers to physical violence being carried out in relation to somebody's personal home address. Viruses also need hosts. They can't really replicate without occupying living cells. And we felt like you could perhaps think of social media platforms as hosts. So they are living organisms that abusers can occupy in order to reproduce their infections. So as hosts, platforms need to really question their responsibility to immunize themselves and protect their users against these types of infections. In the computational sense, a virus is a malicious software program that when it's executed, um, replicates itself by modifying other computer programs and inserting its own code. So viruses are designed to be a corrupting force. And um, I think certainly the notion of malice seems very relevant when we're talking about hate speech and all manner of psychological violence that's being carried out against different groups. Like online abusers, uh, computer viruses exploit vul vulnerabilities. So abusers' behaviors, they often reproduce or exploit existing forms of marginalization. Also, computer viruses use um, complex anti-detection or stealth um, strategies to evade antivirus software. And analogously, online abusers use strategies of anonymity and evasion to avoid detection. Finally, the figure of the virus is also implied in the phenomenon of virality. So, you know, things going viral is, is a fundamental aspect of uh, the cultural politics of the internet. And um, I think as as with all features of the internet, there's the potential for this to be emancipatory or exploitative. Um, so viral images can, of course, disrupt the mainstream media and drive social and political change, but they can also fuel hate campaigns against women or other groups. So really our idea for the evening was that by exploring this figure of the virus and by sharing some of the ways that you can fight it, 
um, we would be able to transform ourselves into antibodies or, and become agents of change. So that was the reason why we chose to frame this whole um, event as a digital clinic. And we are now going to go right into a series of presentations. We have uh, the first one is a video which has been sent to us from New York by an artist called Caroline Cinders. Um, she is um, a machine learning designer and an artist, and she's a, also a digital anthropologist, and she's obsessed with language and culture and images. And she has sent this presentation about um, fighting online abuse with artificial intelligence. Hi, I'm Caroline Sanders, and this is my talk, Emotional Design and Traumatic Datasets. I'm a machine learning designer. I work at the Wikimedia Foundation on the Anti-Harassment Tools team as a design researcher. One of the things we do at Wikimedia, which is the nonprofit that powers Wikipedia, is we're thinking of ways to use different kinds of technology to analyze harassment and then create uh, products and solutions towards mitigating harassment. For the past couple of years, I've worked specifically inside of machine learning uh, I used to work at IBM Watson as a design researcher, really looking at how products are using something called natural language processing. So we sort of break down uh, written text and, uh, and understand that text. Um, as a design researcher, what that means is I work with engineers and technologists to then turn software capabilities and things like APIs and algorithms into products. I've also been studying online harassment and protests for the past five years. One of the things I think that's important to keep in mind is how does data fit into machine learning? So data uh, and data sets are kind of the identifying characteristics of any machine learning algorithm of any artificial intelligence system. The data you feed your machine learning algorithm will determine how that algorithm works or what it does. In a way, to think about it is if you're creating a chatbot around ordering pizza, you have to feed it data about pizza. If you create a pizza chatbot and feed it data about shopping or women's clothing, you've now created a chatbot on women's clothing. So the data can really determine what the algorithms do and how they work well. Uh, a project that I'm really inspired by that really tackles this idea of data and data characteristics is Mimi Onawa's work specifically around missing data sets. Mimi is an artist and researcher uh, based out of New York who has been creating data sets around different kinds of questions. Um, this project around missing data sets is a list of data sets that don't exist. One of the things she really highlights is what does it mean to be, what does it mean to create data around people? What does it mean to create data around things that don't, that haven't been caught before? Some of these things we do need, uh, and you can see from this picture, uh, more accurate birth registration, um, publicly available gun trace data, and there are some things that we don't need as a data set. What would happen if we had the location of every mosque inside the United States? Uh, that, would, that puts people at a disadvantage. That creates more danger for people. Her work really explores this, and I think it's, uh, it's one of the works I find most inspirational when, I, when I've started to think about how do we create emotional design around traumatic data sets? How do we create data sets around online harassment? So how do you create an emotional data set? Um, one thing to keep in mind is how, how, how are we defining emotion? What is emotion? Well, I work in online harassment. How do we think of harassment? Every data point about online harassment is a real person's traumatic experience. Every report we get around someone who has been threatened on the internet, someone who's been threatened on a certain platform, that is a data point and it's also someone's lived experience. When you're creating a collection of data and you're trying to create a system using machine learning to analyze harassment, what you're dealing with uh, is someone's pain. How do you contextualize that pain? How do you build it out? How do you honor the qualitative nature of this, the fear that someone went through and the pain that they experienced at the hands of another? And I bring this up to think about the fact that data is incredibly personal and data is important. Uh, and Mimi's work has really inspired the way I think about data. But also, how do you define and break down online harassment? How do you honor that it's someone's traumatic experience, but how do you also then define it? I think a good example is the word doxing. Doxing is the release of public documents. Um, you have to break that down. So how would you create a machine learning system to analyze doxing? Well, you should define it. What is it? It's a verb, harassment. The release of a user's personal documents or information online 
um, or information that's around someone's close circle or networks around the release of public documents. This word is mainly used in Western social media. Where can doxing occur? Well, it can be on specific kinds of platforms like Facebook, Twitter, 4chan, 8chan, Reddit, right? And then doxing information is often then stored, stored on third-party websites like Pastebin. So from this diagram, you can see I've broken down doxing to the platforms, how it's stored, and also what it can exist as. Name, credit card data, name, home address, name, work address, someone's dead name, a name or a phone number, or parents' names and addresses. Where does doxing occur? All right, so then we should ask ourselves questions like, well, where does doxing occur? What were the events leading up to it? Is it tied to a pre-existing harassment campaign or an isolate incidence? This diagram I'm showing breaks down the quantitative and qualitative aspects of doxing. Is there good doxing? Is there bad doxing? Uh, then what makes up doxing, that's the quantitative aspects of it. You could then create a system to start to analyze all these different forms of, of harassment using machine learning. How would we do that though? I would suggest an engaging supervised machine learning. What does that mean? That's where a human goes through and starts to hand tag data and they're teaching the system to understand this. So in the previous diagram, someone could go through and hand tag bad forms of doxing, like releasing someone's name and credit card data on the platform, and then think about the contextualization of good doxing. Um, is that something that protesters use, for example, when labeling uh, or naming uh, neo-Nazis? Is that good or bad? Or are we unsure? Where does that fall? Instead of having a system uh, autonomously, algorithmically do this, a person can go through and add nuances. So again, the anti-harassment anti machine learning system can think about things like pre-existing campaigns, interactions, or trends. Wait, what happened prior to the event occurring? Um, it can also help, uh, people can help work with an algorithm to create a, gen uh, a corpus, which is the data set, of generated keywords, um, of auto-generated keywords, and then keywords pulled specifically from ethnographic research and researchers studying fields in the system. This could be a dashboard, something that is monitoring 4chan or Twitter, etc. And then another person can go in and think about things like what players were involved, what platforms, what are the interaction patterns like design and words, was this a pre-existing thing, is there a date and time cutoff? Um, and by having someone label this data, the system can then learn how trends are, are existing inside the greater platform. And this really highlights this, uh, the, the import, one of the important takeaways around online harassment, which is data about people is contextual and qualitative, and it can be quantitative as well. But what are the qualitative aspects of what we're engaging in? And how do you think of something that inherently works better with qual quantitative data, machine learning, and build on these qualitative aspects? It's creating a space where using supervised machine learning, ethnographers and researchers are engaging with the system and thinking about all these different slices of this emotional data set. How data is caught and kept and copied has political and emotional ramifications. How do we together as a community define what harassment is? How do we break it down? How do we provide suggestions? We need community input from victims, activists, as well as just participants inside of the general internet. What we need is equity. Thinking about how an emotional data set needs to be built and also that it's working with with individuals' trauma, can this lead to a greater conversation of how, of how traumatizes the internet, of what kind of violent data are we dealing with, especially when we're trying to create spaces of equity as we're trying to create a more feminist internet. To solve harassment, we have to think about the political ramifications of the data we're engaging with. Every data point is a person's interactions. That's a person's emotions. I think we're allowed to be vibrant and scared and happy and sad on the internet and we should have spaces to do those things and our data shouldn't be just viewed as analytics or ways to feed in larger systems around ads our data should be viewed as self-portraits of ourselves our data is representational of us it is inherently emotional thank you weird to applaud someone that's not in the room but <clears throat> I think it was good that we did and, and we now have Rhiannon Williams and Helen Brewer and they are going to talk to you about organized attacks hi 
So we're going to be looking at two different kinds of group and organized attacks. The Gamergate incident and the role and implications of mass media. Group and organized attacks can be both individuals acting alone under a common cause or as an intentional and collective campaign to take someone down. The nuance between an attack targeting individuals and one that targets a symbolic representation or political identity can be found in its motivation. For this, we need to consider the historic, patriarchal, and violent influences of our societal structures. So uh, one of the interesting things about these group attacks that are organized um, is basically that very often they're not in response necessarily to bullying a particular individual just for the hell of it. And it's a lot more about actually targeting what that group perceives the individual's beliefs to be. So it's more about their politics and their views. And um, Gamergate is a really interesting example of this. So the Gamergate incident was um, where a group of prominent women in the games industry received a lot of online abuse from gamers, including rape and death threats, um, the release of personal material, and very sort of personalised hate campaigns that were spearheaded against them. And all of this was simply in response to those women um, critiquing the way that the games industry portrays women, but also uh, just because of them making headway with their own careers in what these gamers considered to be their own territory. Um, and the victims of this hate campaign were impacted quite heavily. So Anita Sarkeesian, who's a media critic, for example, had to cancel several talks because of death threats and bomb threats made against very specific locations. And um, oh, there we go. And um, uh, other female games developers as well had to sort of fear for their safety and the safety of their families because of similar threats. And I think it's quite important to point out as well that these are extremely mild examples compared to most of the stuff that was going on. So the rest of the threats were very sort of graphic and personal, and I, can, I decided not to put those ones up there. But, um, yeah, it was interesting because Gamergate made, I mean, made the in games industry look terrible in terms of inclusivity. Um, but it's also a very interesting example of how organised attacks online can really demonstrate um, a group's methods of maintaining the status quo. So in this case, the status quo of the games industry being a male-dominated environment that perpetuates these very limiting and damaging stereotypes of women. So I think, therefore, it's possible for us to use online um, organized group attacks to sort of map political and social change, or at least the moods and how people are feeling on a larger sort of scale. Um, and I think we can use them as a sort of litmus test, I guess, in this sense, for figuring out how people are feeling. And I think that Gamergate can be read as a movement in sort of response to uh, the growing visibility of more marginalised online communities. Um, I think it's, it's quite helpful overall then to, when we look at these um, organised attacks, to not just focus on the forensics of the bullying, but look at the large scale impact and implications. Because um, if we pay attention to who's saying what about who and why, we can almost predict the changes that might be on the horizon and who, which kinds of norms we're going to be trying to preserve in response to that. And that's going to enable us to then think more critically about whether we want to preserve those norms or whether it is actually time for a change and that change is a good thing. So a more pervasive and insidious form of attack comes in the form of the mainstream media. Um, I don't know if some of you have seen this, but earlier in October this year, Cambridge student and women's officer Lola Olufemi was targeted and defamed in a telegraph following an open letter that was published to propose a decolonized syllabus at her university. Olufemi received a torrent of sexist and racist abuse to her Facebook and email. She was intentionally picked out as a young woman of color, her face printed on the front page. The open letter was clearly seen as a threat to the establishment and the institutions that helped build it. We know that Britain has one of the most concentrated media environments in the world, with three companies in control of 71% of national newspaper circulation and five companies in command of 81% of local newspaper titles. And it's easy to see and feel the link between the conservative patriarchal media and the influence it has had on online abuse and attacks. The media has provided the ammunition with decades of manipulated and vitriolic journalism. They endorse and encourage abuse to those with legitimate criticisms of power and patriarchal structures. Online organized attacks can not only be seen as spearheaded by keyboard warriors, but it's critical we acknowledge the professional trolls who are actually employed to do this. 
Every day, social media platforms and online news outlets explode with government and media-backed actors who fuel racialized and gender harassment in order to influence and intimidate public opinion. And it's beginning to become harder to see where one begins and the other ends. The internet, however augmented, still exists as an outlet, an alternate virtual space for the dominant power structures in place. And if we seek to dismantle them, then the shift needs to happen in both worlds. So how then do we respond to these online attacks individually? It's very tempting to sort of chat back to someone who's attacked you online and try to silence them. But I think one of the major issues with these people attacking us using the internet is that we receive a very limited two-dimensional impression of what they're like. We just sort of see the tip of the iceberg that they've allowed us to see. And this really dehumanizes them to us the same way that they dehumanize their own victims. And so it's a lot harder for us to empathize with them and understand them. And therefore, it's a lot more difficult for us to get on their level and explain to them or educate them about their own victim situation. So um, Kira Lien made a documentary called uh, The Internet Warriors, where he basically took the portrait of and interviewed various people who identified themselves as trolls, um, who invest time basically in attacking people online. And I think one of the most interesting findings from that documentary was that so many of these people um, were actually very, very lonely themselves. And I think we then get this um, very important context of the fact that some of these trolls believe they've been shunned by society themselves, or perhaps they have been shunned by society themselves. And I think that's what's then fueling this um, resentment and this vitriol that they come out with and these prejudices. And I think that's um, fundamental for us to keep in mind when responding to them. So I don't believe that victims of online violence should have to kowtow before their attackers. And I certainly wouldn't put more onus on... Um, basically project, sorry, protecting uh, trolls over victims or marginalized groups. But I do believe that uh, recognizing where the hatred comes from is fundamental to then preventing it. So while a perfect smackdown to someone who's just attacked you could make them think twice about doing it again, only education will challenge their core beliefs. And that's what will eventually dismantle this whole violent system from the roots upwards. And how do we tackle something as massive and per pervasive as the mainstream press. The day after the article about Lola Olufemi was published, a telegraph printed a correction and clarification, albeit on page two and in small print. This was after the university and other outlets called the telegraph out for misinformation and inciting the attacks. This need for media accountability is necessary when it can lead to a form of cyberbullying. Famously, we can look at Monica Lewinsky as the first victim of a sort of coordinated press and online attack. Decades later, she still carries that stigma today. With our lives much more intertwined with our online identity and data much more readily available, we could all be potential victims of an attack. So it's important we seek to develop and understand our individual and collective rights. Call them out, hold them to account, and create a space for more independent media. Thanks. presenting about revenge porn, which is the release of sexually explicit images without the subject's consent. Well, first of all, I want to highlight that the term itself, revenge porn, is actually barbed and unsatisfactory because it fails to convey that the sharing of such Im images violates, is a violation of individual privacy. The victims must also use this term, which is actually rooted in the same violent and misogynistic language created by perpetrators to use and abuse against them. So Facebook received more than 51,000 reports of revenge porn in January alone. And 90% of those revenge porn victims are women. And in the UK, out of 160 cases of revenge porn reported in 2015, 61% saw no action taken. So that's pretty shit. In the words of Lisa Simpson, this whole damn system is so wrong. Screams. <laughs> Um, so I want to look at the, the, the different stories so, and how different platforms and users are responding to this, these forms of abuse. So one of them is the platform Facebook. And Facebook are actually trialing a new technology in Australia which helps to combat this issue of revenge porn by encouraging individuals to send in their sexually explicit images 
into Facebook um, so that images can be hashed, in which this means make the company converts the image into a unique digital fingerprint that can be used to identify and block any attempts to re-upload the same image. Facebook's piloting this in, in Australia, in a place with actually where online abuse is even more of an issue than it is in this country, as one in five Australians have fallen prey to abusive behavior online, which includes revenge porn. And 50% of those, um, those victims come from minority groups, such as uh, Aboriginal Australians, and those with disabilities, which is really, really sad. Um, so although you can say, oh, you know, from a headline perspective, oh, this is really great, you know, Facebook are tackling revenge porn, but actually, if you look deeper under the surface, this, this technology was developed in 2009 by Microsoft in an effort to clamp down on the same, on same images of sexually abused children being circulated all over the internet. It was the same technology used to identify violent imagery such as beheadings and child abuse. So this is problematic because by putting... Um, these, these images, categorizing these Im the images of women, which should be kind of celebrated because a lot of images are, you know, selfies. So they're taken, you know, by the women themselves autonomously. So they should be celebrated as, as a woman claiming back her own representation. But actually, by putting these images in the same category as violent imagery and all these horrible images, it's like criminalizing the female body and foregrounding the, the, the female body is dangerous, which is actually a stereotype that goes right back to the story of Adam and Eve, which is just ridiculous. Um, and also Facebook is encouraging you to send in your most intimate photos, which is ironic because the business was once started upon a, a hot or not website in which Zuckerberg and his mates like rated the shaggability of, his, of the women at his university. So it's really questionable whether he actually understands image-based abuse, really. Um, and again, this technology places the responsibility and the emotional and digital labor onto the victims of online abuse instead of actually the perpetrators themselves. And in a social media culture which has coked us into belief that to share is to be validated and to be connected, this coercion leaves us so vulnerable to the exploitation that when sites don't actually take responsibility or attempt to understand the abuse of power that's at hand. And then I want to explore this um, user experience from Emma Holton. So Emma Holton in 2011 had her, um, her email account and her Facebook hacked. Um, and so private images of her, her personal information, was uploaded onto the internet for everyone to see, along with the tagline, let's ruin this bitch's life. Um, so people all around the world suddenly had access to naked images of her, which she took for her boyfriend when she was 17. Her contact details, her workplace, the names of her friends and family. Um, and with that came re receiving of hundreds of sexually explicit messages, rape threats, death threats, and the example of her story gives us a realization that there's, there's such a disconnect between URL and IRL practices because online abuse has no time linearity. Um, it's part of a continuum because even though Emma's abuse happened seven years ago, if someone uploads images of her to a new site today, then the abuse is happening right now. And she said quite hauntingly in an interview, in a way, I'll forever be 17 years old and naked in my boyfriend's bedroom. But she took a really positive response in 2016 where she created a photographic um, project called Consent, um, where she created a, a series of images of naked photos of herself, highlighting that the issue of the stig is not a stigma around the women's body, but attackers are specifically wanting to share images without permission. It's the unwilling participation of these victims which is considered erotic, which is something that's so dark and twisted that really needs to be a whole culture change and a really getting into the minds of, of these people because there's something so wrong going on there. And she said, I, really, I didn't really feel ashamed that people saw my breasts, but I felt ashamed that I hadn't got the right to decide. So I'll just leave with that. Um, I wanted to speak today about the fine line um, between 
hate speech and free speech. And I thought I would start with a question for you, for us, which is, um, what should the limits of free speech be? And specifically, what should the limits of free speech online be on the internet? So hate speech is speech which, att which attacks individuals of groups or groups based on their race, religion, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, disability, or gender. Effectively, hate speech is speech that leads to hate actions. Um, in the words of John Stuart Mill, the expression of our ideas and opinions is so important that it should be as free as possible, subject to harm principle. So as early as 1863, even finally, <laughs> even um, British academia understood that the behavior of another citizen should never be inflicted, uh, sorry, should never be constrained unless it harms someone else. Um, Basically, hate speech comes down to an incitement of discrimination. It's about what you do with your words and what your words, what your words do after they leave your body. Um, the internet comes from a state that assumes quality of a free nation that, trans uh, that transgresses borders. Um, for those lucky enough to have access to the internet, um, illusions of a borderless world may or may not last um, because governments impose varying degrees of censorship, filter, and control on on the users using the internet. Um, for example, China famously um, bans major Western social media sites like Instagram or Facebook, um, as well as sources of unbiased information like Wikipedia. Um, some restrictions, like in China, are clearly noticeable, while others are perceived much subtler. Um, for sites having their own policies, independent of your location, nation, or state. Um, so who is really to decide what is and isn't acceptable on the internet? Um, one of the big players, of course, in this discussion is Facebook. And I'd somewhat like to look deeper into their um, Facebook's moderation policy policies and the experiences of the moderators um, having to make these decisions. Um, this is a video um, of work by Eva, um, Eva and Franco Mattis. Um, they interviewed dozens of um, Facebook moderate, um, not just, yeah, moderators and um, on their experience of their job. Content moderation, for me at least, is not choosing whether something is okay for someone to see, but more determining if it meets certain criteria. It's up to the content provider, or host, what people should or should not see. I just make sure everything meets those demands. I guess it would be similar to how police officers don't make laws, they just enforce them. I guess the basic idea is that I'm scanning through a group of images, to determine if any of them contain adult content. One job I've done quite a bit, involves checking groups of animal pictures, to make sure they are all of animals, and didn't include human faces, or anything offensive. I've done content moderation for various companies, but I never knew who my employers were. Cool. Um, I kind of wanted to take a closer look at these guidelines that these monitors use to um, review and detect content that is to be removed. Um, so documents intended as guidelines for Facebook moderators have been leaked and published by The Guardian this May. Um, there now is a section on The Guardian website dedicated to these Facebook, file, Facebook files. Um, in this, I recommend you to check it out. Um, in this version, the guidelines seem to be, I mean, there's different versions, but in this version, the guidelines seem to rely on language, distinguishing attacks against ideologies from attacks against a specific um, group of people. So Facebook says they will protect individuals, groups, and humans. This is an example where moderators would be expected to remove hatred against homosexuals or Christians in this one. However, um, in the case of migrants, the same rules don't seem to apply. Um, there are some examples in which one, like these are some examples in which moderators were advised not to remove the content. And I quote, migrants are so filthy, in brackets. Filthy is an adjective, not a noun. We consider this to be a description of their appearance rather than nature. Boom. Um, <laughs> so who, does, who really decides what classifies as hate speech? Who draws the line between, the, uh, between free speech and hate speech online? It's, it seems like a really thin threshold. Um, and clearly, policing of online content is political and censorship is political. Um, so working on net neutrality may not be enough, but it definitely is a start. 
um, to recognize the absurdity of a Silicon Valley coder determining what content gets censored is probably also a good start. Um, if we endorse freedom at all costs, how do we define hate speech and do we want censorship to come from a platform like Facebook? Um, Facebook own, if you didn't know, um, WhatsApp, Instagram, and also Oculus Rift, amongst other branches. Um, and it is concerning for free speech advocates um, f having Facebook as one of the largest censors online. Um, yeah, to finish, I'd kind of like us to consider what is the free speech of a feminist internet and um, what is the future of, say, of hate speech in an internet that is controlled by providers, networks, and governmental states? We can discuss later. <laughs> Thank you so much, everybody. They were a really interesting set of provocations. If people have questions, store them up. We'll try and make time to um, address them at the end. But now I'd like to welcome our panel to the front. I'm really excited to welcome our panel. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so we have Councillor Shay Akiwowo to my left here. Shay is a locally elected politician in East London and the youngest black female councillor in Newham. She is the founder of Glitch UK, which is an online abuse campaign which she set up after herself facing some really horrific um, racist and sexist online abuse when a video of her um, in the European Parliament went viral earlier this year. And through Glitch UK, Shay um, lobbies social media companies to do more to stop online abuse. And um, she's developed a set of recommendations on how they can adequately and consistently address online hate speech and violence against women and girls. Um, she's developed personalized, interactive, and informative training workshops on this subject for young people. And in 2018, she's also going to be training online tech companies as well. Also welcome to Travis Alabanza. Travis is a performer, writer, and thinker based in London. Um, their work uses live performance, text, and images to scream about black, trans, and gender non-conforming politics uh, with a particular interest in harassment and public space. Um, and in the last two years, Travis has been um, noted by Dazed, ID, Guardian, and Artsy as one of the most prominent emerging queer voices. Uh, he became, they became the 2016-17 artist in residence at the Tate, sold out the opening of their new show, Burgers, and recently starred in the critically acclaimed Jubilee at the Royal Exchange Theatre. And their new book, Before I Step Outside, You Love Me, looks in detail at transphobic harassment. So welcome, Travis. And finally, Asmina Drodia. She is a researcher in the technology and human rights team at Amnesty International Secretariat. She is currently investigating the human rights implications of online violence and abuse against women on social media platforms through research and policy analysis of existing international human rights, standards, national le legislation, company community standards and reporting mechanisms. And she was previously the campaign coordinator in the Amnesty International Gender, Sexuality and Identity Program from 2011 to 16, where she coordinated global campaigns on gender, LGBTI rights and indigenous people's rights. So an extraordinary group of people to discuss this issue. Um, I wanted to start by asking you each, um, if you can say something about your, your personal experiences of online harassment and or why this topic is really important to you. Um, so my experience, right, I was at the gym, minding my own business, doing me as I'm going to get fit, summer's coming, summer body ready. Uh, yes. <laughs> I go on my phone, try, get my Spotify list ready. Like I'm setting the scene because I want you guys to understand what it's like, yeah? Just getting my Spotify ready, I'm about to go on the treadmill, my phone's buzzing. I was like, what's going on, what's going on? Is it Idris Alba? I'm checking, I'm checking, I'm checking my phone. I'm seeing, I'm seeing people saying, yes, honey, I like your video. Yeah, brilliant, black girl magic, great, great, great. So I'm carrying on on my, on my phone, but you know when you get notifications, it cuts out the music. So I said, why does it keep cutting out? What's going on? That's when I saw it started getting nasty. 
I started getting called the, uh, getting called nigger, negro, niggeress. I didn't know there were so many variations of the word negro. I was told I should get lynched, hang myself, my clit should be slit, um, um, your monkey ape, Harimbe's cousin. And I did look a bit fat and a bit dark then, so I was a little bit like, okay, good one, but still that is inappropriate for you to say. And then this was constant and constant. I was like, I'm meant to be going yoga. I'm meant to be like, do, you know, going to go, to go Morrison's food shopping. This has completely interrupted my day. And I think that's the point I want to try and drive home that you do not expect online abuse. You're going about your business, you're doing you, but it enters your real life world. You start getting paranoid. I'm thinking, crap, I'm a counselor. My details are online. I'm on the Joe Cox leadership program. I know what it means for somebody to take out their hatred online and make it make it a physical thing. I'm panicking. So I'm now calling my local police officer. I'm saying, this is what's happened. What should I do? You need to come to the police station. I was like, ah, oh, shit. <laughs> it's just got serious. So I'm now on, my battery's dying. I'm hungry. I was meant to go food shopping. I've had to cancel plans. I'm at the police station trying to explain why this is serious to, to frontline police. And we can get onto that around the whole reporting issue and police not taking it seriously enough. Um, but I'm now at the police station spending two hours of my time having to read these messages across YouTube, across Twitter that are constant and now me being in fear of my life. And then having to explain to my mum, just be a bit wary the next couple of days. My mum's African. She's like, eh? Shay, what have you done? Now I'm having to manage my mum's anxiety. She's seeing me on TV. Eh, oh my daughter, oh, we didn't leave Nigeria to go meet her. Oh, to do. I'm having to now manage all of that. And I'm, I'm laughing at all of this stuff and I'm making jokes, but it's, a, it's the pinpoint. It's not just online. When people say that, call them out on the ball because it affects not just you, but your family. The anxiety and the panic attacks afterwards, it's immense. And it's because people, don't dis people disagree with you. It's because people, particularly if you're a woman and you are strong, they find that confronting. And that needs to be challenged. Thank you. Yeah, it was um, really interesting hearing you describe the gym because it was similar to me being in like a state of normality and then suddenly being in a state of like something so abnormal. Um, so for me, my experience of harassment has always been like a, a trickle before like a flood is that I'm describing it to people is that before the last month, I still experienced harassment. I think being trans and being um, somewhat recognized online means that you always like kind of get one or two comments a day of someone telling you that you're a tranny or that you're a freak or stuff like that. But it was always kind of manageable and uh, that never really bothered me. Um, but last month in November, um, whilst I was working in Jubilee in Manchester, um, I went into a changing room and was kicked out of the changing room because I was a threat to women's safety um, and was told that I wasn't allowed in the changing room. Um, I then reminded them that their policy on changing rooms had changed recently, three months ago, that actually um, they were all gender neutral changing rooms and that they had separate changing rooms for people because of this. Um, they then kicked me out. Uh, I then tweeted about it um, as a complaint to Topshop. Uh, kind of forgetting that my Twitter was no longer a place with like just my friends following me and that I had this platform. Um, I went to sleep and I woke up and it was this same kind of feeling of having your phone. Um, I actually got a message from Twitter saying that they could not process any more notifications on my phone. Um, and I was trending uh, in the UK and I was like, oh, cool, I must have done something cool. But actually I hadn't. Um, I woke up to the Daily Mail, um, The Sun, uh, The Telegraph, The Times, um, British Vogue, all these newspapers doing a fake story that I had changed the policy around changing rooms and that Topshop, because of my complaint, had now changed their policy to gender neutral changing rooms. In those, uh, in those magazines and photos, they were using old photos of me from like 14 years old with a full beard and mustache and um, old tweets of mine when I'd written when I was 13, 14, identifying as a gay man. So completely setting me up to be delegitimate for what I was actually using the changing rooms for, which I was looking like this, meaning that I have experienced harassment in, those cha in male changing rooms whilst like this. I just wanted to buy some clothes. Um, and then what entailed was a week of 
um, relentless attacks um, online. I was trending because of the amount of death threats that I was receiving and the amount of times that people were using my name. Um, they mentioned doxing earlier. I was actually doxed. Luckily, I just moved house. So um, they actually used an old address, but I had a neighbor call me up and say that they'd had letters through the door um, calling me a pedophile, calling me um, a threat to women's safety. Um, I was working at the theater at the time, and they then called up the theater to address, because I was playing the lead role, to fire me. Um, someone actually shouted out in the middle of my monologue in the theater um, that I was a tranny, and they had to be removed from the theater. Um, so it was a week of like real how, and it's actually ironic that we're talking about it now because the Sun, I thought I was over it, but the Sun just put out an article about me today again. Um, and I think what's interesting about what I'm saying about harassment is I think that I see similarities between cisgender women's harassment and trans feminine people's harassment, but actually I saw really key differences in my experience uh, to, I'm actually good friends with Lola, and Lola's experience, which happened a week prior to mine, is that the identities of the people doing the harassment felt different. Mine weren't these hidden bots, these eggs profiles. They were actually had really identifiable, proud profiles. A lot of them, we looked at the demographic and they were mums. So a lot of the people that were harassing me um, weren't hiding their identities. They were mums and people that identified as feminist that had then uh, put a Reddit account online to try and find details about me. There's a Reddit page at the moment that's saying, this person must have slept with an under 16 year old, all trans people have, let's find someone and tell them to come forward. And these are mums that you can trace back. Some of them have feminist uh, blogs online. So for me, what I think about online harassment is one, definitely echoing what you said, it has real life implications. It's completely changed my last month, my public safety, I was being shouted at in the street, et cetera, et cetera. But also I think that when we add a trans narrative in there, um, the dialogue of who's doing the harassing changes, but also our protection and who comes and rallies behind you and how the press and the left-wing press maybe didn't rally behind me in the same way that they'd rally behind other people of high-profile um, harassments. And I think that has everything to do with being trans. Mm -hmm. I guess my, my experience is more of the fear of experiencing on, online abuse um, and harassment. So similar to Shay, I actually um, had a video of myself go, well, a video that I took go viral last summer. Um, I was sexually assaulted on the street in London. Uh, I confronted the perpetrator, went up to him, schooled him on feminism, told him that he violated my space, my body, that it wasn't okay. You know, tried to call the police, like called 101, so I got voicemail. Um, <laughs> call 999. Um, and, um, you know, he kept telling me not to make a big deal out of it, and he told me that he did it because he was drunk and I was attractive. So I said that I would leave, but I told him that I wanted him to say my name, I wanted him to apologize for what he did, and I wanted him to do it on video. Um, so I, I filmed it, I put it online, and you know, the next day, within hours, it went, out, it went viral very quickly. It was picked up in many different countries, with many different media outlets. Um, and I remember having a very serious conversation with my sister before I posted it, and she was just like, you need to know that right now you are challenging the patriarchy and you are putting up a video that very clearly does this, and you're a woman and you're a woman of color, and you, know, you, you might want to think about that twice before you take that, you know, before you do it. Um, and so I put it up, and I didn't really know what to accept, expect, and then quickly it you know, garnered lots of views. Um, I, so I changed my name on all of my social media platforms, made everything that was pr pr uh, public, so my Twitter and my Instagram private. Uh, I changed every single photo that I had of myself to a photo of me from the back. Um, I asked my family to change their last name because I have a very particular last name. Um, when my father immigrated to Canada, they misspelled it, so there's four of us in the world. <laughs> um, so it's very easy to find my family or my immediate family. Um, and just the fear, the fear was terrifying. Um, and you know, I didn't actually, you know, fortunately I wasn't, I didn't expect, uh, experience that much online abuse, but that was probably because I spent day and night thinking about how to avoid it. Um, and I'm very fortunate because, because my job, you know, my day job is working on gender and sexuality and identity issues, and I was already sort of looking at these issues generally. Um, I was able to really hone in on this issue, and because it was so personal to me, um, I was able to develop a project where I look specifically at women's experiences of abuse and violence on social media platforms, um, looking particularly at the, the impact on your freedom of expression, so the silencing, the censoring impact, the fact that women and you know, gender non-conforming people leave social media platforms every day because they do not want to deal with it, it is not worth it. 
or sometimes they don't have a choice, they're dependent on it for their work or for networks or solidarity, et cetera, um, and they're forced to, to deal with the abuse. And I really wanted to look at the psychological impact of online abuse um, and to really sort of explore and really break down this idea that, like you said, that you know online abuse can be ignored or just turned off and it's not as real because it happens in the digital world versus you know the physical world. Yeah, I think you've all actually painted a very clear picture of how it does have an impact in the real world. Not that we want to make that distinction between the online world and the offline world, but, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, the ripple effect out towards your family, you know, that's a really um, visceral example, I think. I guess um, one of the things that came up in several of the presentations was um, what's the responsibility of platforms? Mm -hmm. Um, it would be really good to hear, Shay, from you about um, what you feel that they're doing well, where they're falling short. Um, what's your perspective on that? Um, yeah, so after the whole online abuse thing happened and I was doing all these media stuff and I was getting people, to, you know, telling me I'm snowflake, I'm weak and this and that. And I was like, no, I'm not. Thank you very much. Words are powerful. Words mobilise people and words can turn to action. And... Um, we need, like you said, this distinction between online and offline. I'm really pleased, actually, in August this year, um, if you commit online hate speech, it's seen as the same as if you committed it on the street. And actually, we need to start getting, getting to that point. But after the whole aftermath, I was just a bit like, this is wrong. We need to do something about it. And that's kind of the stubbornness in me, not really realising what I was going to start taking, or what I was about to embark on. But I started documenting my experience. I started saying, I started talking about it as a victim, the things that I had to do, like logging all of the abuse and having to repeat it over and over again, having to, um, um, having to, when I had to report it to the social media companies and then they're not taking it seriously. So I had to crowdsource my, my Twitter followers to help me report it. And so it meant I was attracting more attention. And I was annoyed at the fact that it took three, four different accounts. I had to get everyday sexism as well to help me report it because I thought their state, their, their Twitter account having the blue tick and having a lot of numbers um, and followers would have helped. But it was annoying because it, there, was, there were accounts where you know, people were saying, you know, you're a nigger or, you know, um, I can't wait to exterminate you or when are we going to round up all our white people to kill black people? This was staying on YouTube and Twitter for days. And so, I don't know if you guys know the broken window theory, but if you leave a broken window in an estate, then you start seeing someone leave a, tra uh, a bin bag, then you start seeing someone pee on it, and you start seeing graffiti, et cetera, et cetera. And so what happens, when, you, when these social media companies choose to ignore my reports and ignore other people's reports, they're, they're attracting more people to come along and to, to, to abuse. So that was one of my first recommendations. Um, just be consistent in enforcing your own your own um, uh, uh, terms and conditions or community guidelines um, and acknowledge the report. So I was reporting and there was just, it was going to this abyss. It was going to this black hole. No one was telling me if it was being acknowledged or not. I'm really pleased now that Twitter now tell you when you've reported something in your mentions, but that wasn't there six, seven months ago. Um, and then also they, they didn't tell you what yes or no to accepting your report. So, for example, Kat Smith, she reported a rape threat on Facebook, and that was left there for three weeks. Then Facebook finally got back to her and said, this doesn't violate our community guidelines. How does a rape threat, doesn't, does, how can a rape threat not violate your community guidelines? But yet, an image of a breast, someone breastfeeding, can. And then, I'm sure as Mina can go into the whole um, intricacies of that, but, you, but Twitter and Facebook aren't being transparent with how they are moderating and how certain things violate. I mean, should I say President 45, Katie Hopkins, how are they still able to have these social media accounts? The, 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 if you're going to keep them there, fine, but you need to explain in according to your terms and conditions that we buy into as users, we're in a contract, a, a mutual contract, you need to explain to us why they get to stay there. And I guess my, 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 my third and biggest um, bugbear or my biggest recommendation is around um, the moderators. Who are these people? I mean, I'm really pleased that there was a leak. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go Google that and find that out. Who are these people? My, my, from my research, they tend to be men. They tend to be white, pale, old men. And they tend to be men in quite conservative countries. So when you see a picture of a breast and a woman, a woman breastfeeding, white, pale, conservative men tend to have a bit of a problem with that. 
But yet, when, it's when, when um, you know, someone like me is being told, um, uh, slit her clit because of a speech that I made about refugees, that man's probably thinking, yeah, she deserves that. Do you understand? There needs to be diversity and transparency in, in how things are being moderated. Are they getting training? Because me going through my own, my own series of tweets, I don't, I don't know how you've done your analysis as well, because that was traumatic. Rereading it over and over again, trying to find out where they were. I could imagine being a moderator, being paid to do that full time. Are they being supported? Are they getting training? Are they, div are, are they diverse? And then what, how, they, how are they, um, how are they reporting, um, reporting to themselves? So for example, say there was 100 um, uh, accounts suspended in 2017. That's their baseline. How are they going to make sure they suspend more accounts next year? How, what, what are their targets? What are their KPIs? How are they tracking people? All of that is a mystery. And if we're going to tell them they're self-regulating, they need to be held more, they need to be held accountable. Otherwise, we need to start demanding that we regulate them. very well on Jelly's presentation, which clearly shows that Facebook's moderation guidelines are just bizarre documents that don't really make any sense, which have all sorts of logical inconsistencies, which you can't really expect outsourced labourers to interpret in a consistent way. So it's obviously a big problem, and it's great that you're doing work to try to address that. Um, Asmina, it would be great if you could expand on your earlier point. You touched on the kind of chilling effect that this is going to have on people and the psychological impact. Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, so just a couple of weeks ago, uh, Amnesty actually released a, a poll where we polled women across eight countries about their experiences of online abuse and the impacts it had, the psychological impact and the freedom of expression impact. Um, so the eight countries included the UK, it was the US, Spain, um, Italy, New Zealand, Denmark. Um, it was mainly countries in the global north. Um, and it was really, you know, I've been working on this issue for a year. Actually, Shay was one of the first people that I interviewed back in February. Um, so it's great to be on a panel with you, Shay. Okay. Um, so and it was really, really quite um, harrowing just going through all of these Excel spreadsheets of the findings. So we found that across the eight countries, almost a quarter of women, so 23%, had experienced abuse or harassment. And then within that, half of the abuse that they had experienced was misogynistic. Um, just, um, I think over a quarter of it included threats of physical or sexual assault. Like I found that stat to be crazy. Um, then there's the fact that of the women who experienced abuse or harassment, 40% felt like their physical safety was in danger or at risk, um, and 60% of the abuse came from strangers. So I think when you contextualize all of that and you look at the fact that actually online abuse against women is a pretty common thing for women to experience, um, and you look at the impact that it has on them, I thought it was really important to ask specific, specific questions about the psychological impact. So some of the questions, um, I, I just couldn't believe, I saw it was over half of women who had experienced abuse or harassment said they had experienced panic, uh, panic attacks, stress, or anxiety. Around two thirds felt a sense of powerlessness. Um, and I think it was 57% of women said that who had experienced abuse said that they had a sense of apprehension or a feeling of apprehension when even thinking about using the internet or social media platforms. And 54% said that they had a feeling of apprehension every time they got a Facebook notification. So, I mean, I think that in itself just spoke so clearly because I have heard so many stories and so many, you know, anecdotal testimonies of women telling me about the worrying sleepless nights that they've had, the fact that they get so stressed out about it, the fact that they cannot, you know, disengage, that they don't know what to do, that it's so personal, it's in their living room, it's in their bedroom, it's in the bathroom, it's everywhere. Um, and I think these stats really, really spoke to it. And then on the flip side, you know, the, the, the psychological impact, you know, there's also a, a silencing or a censoring impact. So 76% of the women polled said that they had, uh, who had experienced abuse, said they made some changes to the way that they use social media platforms. So that's either like an increase in privacy settings or blocking, filtering, muting or changing the content. And a third of women um, said that they changed the way that they express content online. So I think for everyone who thinks that online abuse can be ignored or that it's not real, I mean, women are, are every day are changing the way that they express themselves online, either out of fear of abuse or because of the abuse that they experienced themselves. Um, and I think that's incredibly, you know, as a human rights issue, I mean, women have the right to express themselves freely and equally online with, without fear of violence. Um, right. And so I think what these numbers show is that hopefully just 
help prove what a serious issue it is. The impact of that is what um, spirals because you're seeing, do you remember Laura, I cannot say her surname, Kroonsberg, the BBC yeah, yeah, journalist, yeah, yeah. she had to have security around with her because she was now in fear of her life because of the amount of abuse that she was getting. And that's quite, a, that's heavily seen in America. There's now this big campaign around women journalists being seen, um, be, uh, asking for safety. But if our journalists, our media, and, we, and then let's go into it as well. We want to make sure that journalism and media is diverse. If you're now stopping women who provide at least 50% diversity um, from engaging in the media, providing critique, accountability, breaking news stories, you know, if we, if we don't have those people in those positions, we're only going to be hearing, get, getting a very narrow view of the media. So the, the effects of silencing women in certain professions is huge. If we're moving to e-democracy, we're moving politics and policy online, you know, the, the Europe, Europe is calling for um, e-voting and all of that stuff. If women, 50% of the population, don't even get me started on women of colour, um, people with different sexual orientation, if women, 50% of the population, can't engage safely online, how are they going to engage in democracy? Politicians like Diane Abbott were, were attacked for just being a black woman. But that wasn't just, it wasn't just MPs. Even any woman who was saying that they were conservative, conservative or Labour or Lib Dem were being attacked online, meaning women can't put forward their views on policies about their own government, about how this should be run. There's a big spiral effect from just having a bit of a spat about EastEnders or X Factor, who should have won. I'm happy who won actually on Saturday. But it's more than that. It's having an impact on, on society, on democracy, on how we challenge um, and hold people to account. Thank you. So <clears throat> as we draw to a close, it would be really good to start thinking about positive actions and acting our agency as individuals. Mm. Travis, can you say something about how victims of abuse might be empowered to remedy their situation? Um, I think that what's been really interesting is uh, watching how the communities that I'm part of, mainly predominantly queer and trans people, but also particularly queer and trans people of colour, because when we look at the people that have actually been examples of the media mm -mm, backlash mm -mm. recently, they've all been black folk uh, mm -mm. that's been happening, mm -mm. Um, is what's been really positive is watching how a community then organised to fight back and clap back, but also to create alternative modes of internet. So there's an incredible uh, black queer artist called Zana who created um, an alternative internet social space away from Facebook, away from Twitter for queer and trans people of colour in London to access that were safe from these regulation rules that we were talking about. And I thought that was a really interesting and positive way to push back against it. Um, but also what I found is that um, in documenting this harassment online that I've been facing, both online and offline, um, it's n it did start um, other trans people talking openly about theirs. And it's created a solidarity between, particularly after like this month of non-stop trans uh, kind of media onslaught, um, a solidarity in, okay, we're facing this kind of harsh backlash, but what is also incredible about our community is the resilience to support each other. I feel like within queer and trans communities, um, we've really unlocked a way, but I haven't seen in non-queer and trans communities of building support networks that are alternative because we can't relate back to the police, because we can't go outside and maybe talk to other people about it. Um, so great examples of that, I think, uh, when Monroe Birdgoff faced um, mm. intense media scrutiny for a private Facebook post, um, so many of us were working behind the scenes that day to create eight articles that came out in support of her within mm. maybe, I think it was like within 10 hours, we had eight, we had things in The Guardian, Huck, Independent, etc. And that all came from us being behind the scenes working together. Um, same with Lola, the same group chat came about and we were all working. It does make me think, however, that for example, Lily, Lily Madigan mm. this week, uh, the Labour, uh, the trans woman that went forward for the Joe Cox leadership programme. She's 17 years old, isn't in the media, doesn't have friends with blue ticks, um, right. how she's dealing with it. And then it, and it, it, actually we didn't hear about it for a while and then we had to reach out to her and ask what support. But how she's dealing with it is completely different to how we've all dealt with it. I know that Twitter contacted me when it happened saying, you're about to receive a whole, huge insult. here's what you do for security. I'm wondering if Twitter maybe didn't contact you and if that's dependent on whether or not I have a blue tick or not. So I think there's loads of like 
positives that come with this, but I also want to recognize that some of it may come to my privilege of already having access to people and media. So it makes me think about the people that are harassed that don't have already have a platform. Yeah, I think it's a really important point that, you know, so we can't ignore the fact that social capital makes an absolutely massive difference yeah. in the way that you are, A, attacked in the first place, yeah. and able to respond to it in the second place. So I suppose that calling out for a kind of collective solidarity and group responses is going to be beneficial in either case, but it's still a huge factor, mm -hmm. I think. Um, we're going to have to wrap up because we're running out of time, but I just wanted to ask each of you if you had one piece of brief advice for people to take away, a small action that they could take to help fight the virus, what would it be? Um, I mean, I guess this depends on, you know, what platforms you use and who you follow, but I think um, out of all of the people that I've interviewed about online abuse, one of the things that is so burdensome and tiresome is, and exhausting is having to report it. So if you see online abuse, report it. Report it on someone else's behalf. You don't need to know them. You don't really, in most cases, need to even understand the context. I mean, sometimes it's so clear-cut that, you know, the worst that can happen is the, the platform is going to say it's not abuse, which will most likely happen. But, you know, I mean, you know, just report it, basically. Take, take that emotional burden off, off that person because they're going to be dealing with so much more. Um, I think my advice would be that uh, we have an active agency in how we uh, interact with the internet. We have controls and boundaries and we shouldn't just be passive, meaning you can set up what you want to make sure that your internet experience is healthy as possible. Um, so I think, yeah, uh, maybe a less passive internet user and someone that's more active. Um, yeah, definitely. Don't, don't tweet. Don't, don't, don't forward it on. Don't share it. Don't be part of the problem. So the recent thing that went, uh, went, viral, the, um, went viral last weekend, yesterday, um, was Taylor Swift, name a bad, name a baddest, the baddest bitch. I hate that. I, I even struggle saying it, but I get the point. I get the point, but don't use those words. Do you know what I mean? Don't, so now people have all quote tweeted it and is sharing it. It's gone viral. And, and it's great that people are now sharing different examples of, an amazing, an, of amazing women, but you don't need to compare yourself. You don't need to compare women. Don't fall into that trap of setting women up against another, another woman. So don't be part of the problem. And tell somebody else. So there's a, what, 80 people in the room? If you all tell somebody else, 160 people are now more aware of online violence as a form of violence against women. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Can we give a round of applause? Please? So we have a few minutes. I know it's not long, but does anybody have questions they would like to address to the panel? We won't abuse you. They won't yeah. abuse you. It's maybe not a question, but maybe in a comment regarding the moderators, because you were asking who are these moderators. And I think it's also important to remember that these are also precarized labor and that actually they don't have clear directives and very often they're super traumatized and they don't have any psychological support and it puts them also in a really terrible situation. So it's, um, it's really the platforms that are, I think, quite responsible for putting this kind of situation both on the victims and also the poor moderators. Yeah, sorry. Ask for more, sorry. How can we ask for more from Facebook, Twitter, like all that? Kind of, if they are the ones regulating things, like how can we? Uh, same, shameless plug, be a glitch supporter. We try and host um, information around what's happening in the UK because a lot of the activism around social media companies is in America. So those that sit on the advisory uh, councils to Twitter and Facebook tend to be in America, but we've got our own kind of beef here that we need to make sure we're advocating for. Um, but there's lots of discussion happening um, around MPs facing online abuse. There's been a lots of debates happening in Parliament, Home Affairs, Select Committees. They're bringing in Google and Twitter. Jeremy Hunt, I know he's not a popular bunny, but he had, um, a, he had a roundtable lunch with Google, Facebook and Twitter 
and Instagram because there's been a rise in teenagers committing suicide because of online abuse and linking to mental health. So they're all now trialing different um, things like um, a notification on your phone if you um, have been on Facebook for too long and telling you you should take a break. So they're, so governments are trialing all of this, but you know you need to be buried into it. So that's what Glitch's purpose is, is trying to signpost people to all of this stuff. So yeah, shameless plug, join Glitch. Join Glitch. Thanks. Uh, it's just a, a kind of addition to what's been mentioned, but uh, I've um, watched the uh, documentary film f uh, called Facebookiston. It's about documentary uh, film of uh, you know Facebook and in inside of it at, at some point, and uh, they did a kind of anonymous interview of uh, uh, moderators, and um, uh, this person claimed that they had so many pictures to you know, assess and go through uh, for the moderation that they only had uh, 0 0.9 seconds to uh, see whether one picture is you know, uh, okay or not. So it's actually this process, like, I, I'm assuming like there isn't much time to rationally think and you know, decide whether this image is you know, good or not. So it's to do with uh, how uh, you know, Facebook also sort of like, you know, forces that the workers to go through a huge amount of work as well. I mean, so it's, you know, they, they might not be able to uh, do the uh, kind of very calm and rational decision, make rational decision in that uh, sense. I was thinking that, so I kind of wanted to add that. And if there's any comment or, you know, some uh, something else for that, um, um, I, I'd like, I'd, I'd love to hear <laughs> that. Do you want to yeah, I think yeah, I just I think it's a really important point. So one of the other research projects that we did, um, and you might have seen it when actually when Jeremy Corbyn mentioned it, but it was uh, Amnesty basically developed an algorithm to detect online abuse against female parliamentarians in the UK, um, and we found that in the six weeks leading up to the election, Diane Abbott alone received almost half of all of the abuse that all women MPs who are active on Twitter receive, so 10 times the amount as any other woman. Um, and BAME women were 35% more likely to experience abuse than white women. And even when you took Diane Abbott out of the picture, um, you know, you had just an exponential number of mu more abuse towards women um, of color. And the really interesting part about this process was that we had to statistically, we had to manually label a statistically relevant sample of tweets to try and improve the algorithm because with machine learning, obviously the more labeled data you have, the better you can uh, train the machine to detect abuse. Um, and some of it, like, you know, some of it's clear cut um, and some of it's actually quite objective and it's really difficult to, and when you're looking at moderators and, you know, I have a lot of questions for social media companies about moderators, how they're trained, how they're trained on gender and identity based abuse. Um, but also, it's, it's quite, you look at this, you look at a tweet, or for example, in that, in that instance, and you have just a few seconds to look and decide if that's abusive or not. Um, and we did it on a scale of abusive, not abusive, um, borderline, borderline. And then we actually had different people in our team label, like the same data set. So just to try and get the diverse, you know, diversity of opinions. But I just think it's quite important to, to understand that it is, it can be, it, a lot of the time it's context specific. And a lot of the time it is, um, sometimes it is subjective. So it's quite difficult. And I think that's why there's such a great need for social media platforms to be so much more transparent about who their moderators are and not just who they are, but how, how they're training them on these issues. Because um, one abusive uh, post in one country can mean something completely different in another context or in another language. Um, so it's really important that we're not just focusing on English speaking social media platforms. Um, but also, you know, how they translate into other languages and how they employ moderators in those languages as well. Thank you. Hello. Um, you touched on it briefly before um, about sort of IRL moderators. Do you think that, the, that there's anything that the police force could do yeah. or improve moderating things that happen online? <sighs> I remember that I'm a counsellor, yeah? <laughs> I can say it for you. Oh, no. go, go, you can go. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I share your point about privilege. I understand being a counsellor meant I was getting special treatment um, um, in the, at the police station and the detectives, and then my case got uh, uh, taken to um, the Sadiq, Sadiq Khan's new um, online hate crime hub in London. Um, so there's, there's six detective inspectors um, who are trained on this stuff, and it got, got taken up um, to, to, to that. 
the, the, but my experience isn't common. Your, your average woman or, or queer or trans person, who, or, or just sometimes blokes as well get, get, get it, when they go to a police station, they say, oh, really, you want to report that? Because they're thinking of paperwork, they're thinking this is not important. I have my first ever bit of councillor casework actually um, th uh, this month um, has been around online abuse. So doxing, actually knowing her address and putting it online and yet still the police are not taking it seriously. What do they want to happen for, for her to be a victim of actual assault or rape? Um, so my biggest thing obviously is resourcing. Police don't want to do it because they think paperwork and they've got so much on, so we need to we need to make sure there's proper resourcing. There needs to be training so that no female, no woman, no man is turned away when they want to report a crime. Like no no police officer should should be pushing somebody away to not report it. And thirdly, we need to raise um, we need to um, we, we, we need to increase our citizenship awareness. So we need to know our rights. So we need to know not to take, not, we need to know not to take no for the, um, as the first answer. Does that make sense? I said that'd be long. But yeah, we need to know, actually no police officer, badge X, Y, Z. I pay taxes. You need to retake my, need to take down my statement. I now want a case. I want a case reference number. We need to push back on them too and to get them to, 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 to wake up. But the police could do so, so, so much more. I think I just want to add as well that um, often when people are saying to report to the police, that's assuming that police aren't also already part of that violence. <laughs> yeah, true. So for lots of people of colour, trans people of colour, trans people, queer people, gender non-conforming people, and also like women, like police have been also a source of violence for those people. So I think for me, it was really funny when people were saying report to the police. I was like, I, I've had police say the exact same things that are being said to me online on the street. Um, so I think we need to think, that's for me why reporting systems have to be outside of police structures, because we can't really trust police structures to care for the very people that are being harassed. Um, hello. Um, so where I come from, which is South Korea, I think we're going through a very interesting and bizarre phase um, regarding to feminism and the internet, because um, the internet, in South Korea right now is some place where you uh, identify as feminist, you'll be attacked. Yeah. And um, websites and platforms go against each other. And I think like Twitter is particularly pro-feminist, but others are not. And there is a phenomenon where people just call out on internet feminists and it's like, oh, you're just probably a fat pig behind a screen. And just like all those things, like basically just last week, a very famous actor called out on like women saying that you're not real feminists. And, and he, like verbally threatened women, and like when in in the situation where the um, internet is a is so divided and so hard to connect with your um, offline and online identities regarding feminism, like what can we do? Like how is it seems like an epidemic, and I don't think a lot of people know what to do. And I guess it's a question for the whole of the feminist internet team because it's so confusing. When I was doing my recommendations, I got a massive shock of like um, privilege, Western privilege, that I'm calling for this kind of regulation um, against certain words, et cetera, et cetera. But there are countries that use social media as activism, that use it to galvanize people, revolution. Like I don't think the Arab Spring or Arab Revolution would have happened if it wasn't for social media. The attention around Bring Back the Girls campaign in Nigeria, the Libya, the Libya slave trade, that social media is so important to such to groups that the but the nation state, the leaders don't want it. So I definitely got confronted with like rated, like I need to I need to watch what I'm recommending. I said I do think it needs to be country specific in what we're what we're calling for and it can happen because Twitter's community guidelines, there is a US, UK, Europe version and then there's like a China version. So it is possible um, the Facebook version. Facebook version of the community guidelines for China. So it is possible to have country var var variations. But also look all activism, whether online or offline, is hard. There's going to be naysayers, there's going to be haters, there's going to be, um, you know, people who are, pretend that they're your, your allies and then they, and then they and then they t they switch on you. And I think that is just something to happen. That that's something that's going to happen that I don't think is tied to the internet. Um, we, we're going to have to wrap up because of time. Um, some of our panelists need to leave. I think it's a perfect point to end on actually, because not only is online abuse, but also feminism and feminist internet completely culturally, geographically specific 
Um, so we need to understand that these things are manifesting in different ways depending on who you are and where you are in the world. So that's something that I know that as a group we're going to consider as we go forward and continue this work. So I would just like to say another massive thank you to the panel.